Respect for Fist Day. Uh, this is the second annual uh, hosted and created by In Defense of Animals. And this event today on Respect for Fist Day is also co-sponsored by the film, The Dark Hobby. And we encourage you to see the film and there's a lot of take actions involved with the film and that should be there, how to rent it with the discount in the chat box. So thank you everyone for attending. Uh, this, this day is to recognize fish, the importance of fish to humans, not just on the plate, but as sentient and important animals to coexist with. Uh, we want to talk about the deadly aquarium trade here in Kona, Hawaii, and provide tools to protect fish and coral reefs, the habitat they live in. I'm happy to be moderating today. My name is David McGuire. I am the founder and director of the nonprofit Shark Stewards. We're based in Berkeley, California, but I'm spending a lot of my time here in Kona. So aloha. Our mission is to save sharks from overfishing and the shark fin trade and protect critical marine habitat, which is where they live and the other animals through marine protected areas. Uh, we're hoping to, to be joined today by two very important uh, people working here in uh, Southwest Hawaii to, to manage, to help protect, uh, to, to uh, try to eliminate this harmful commercial uh, trade that is occurring here that you can see in the dark hobby that will be speaking with some of our other panelists. Uh, we're hoping, oh, it looks like Kaimi came in just right on time. <laughs> so Kaimi Kaupiko, welcome, aloha. Uh, Kaimi is a cultural practitioner in the village of Milolii down at the south, a beautiful place, really a special place. He's also a plaintiff in uh, a couple of lawsuits including a current one that we will discuss to protect Hawaiian reefs and fish. We're hoping his father, uh, Willie uh, Kaupiko will also join us maybe uh, he is also a resident of Milolii. Uh, he's a Native Hawaiian cultural practitioner. Uh, he is a steward or konohiki caretaker for the fish and uh, a cultural leader as well. Uh, Kaimi, we're just getting started, so your timing is perfect. It's good to see you. I'm not sure if you're muted or not, but we'll give you uh, some questions to join in. So aloha. Uh, we also have with us Robert Wintner. Uh, he is a uh, a producer of the dark hobby, a writer, a scuba diver, a photographer, kind of a legend. Uh, and he's also known as Snorkel Bob, but he really has been uh, hugely active in protecting coral reefs and fish in Oahu for a couple decades at least. Uh, we have Paula Fauci, who is uh, the director and producer of the dark hobby. And again, I encourage you to see the film. You can go on to Vimeo. Uh, you can also see the trailer on YouTube or on the darkhobby.org website. Uh, we also have Mary fin Finelli, uh, Fish Meal. She's the founder and president uh, to protect fish and address the issues and sometimes the disregard we have for fish as animals that can feel pain, as animals that are sentient beings that deserve our recognition. And then Ashley Byrne of PETA, uh, she's the Associate Communications Director and an activist in her own right. And uh, Lisa Levinson, last but not least, uh, our co-host in Defense of Animals Campaigns Director. So I just wanted to give a brief overview and then we'll launch into the questions and conversations. We encourage our audience to go to the Q&A down at the bottom. Uh, you can message in the chat. We will also post several take actions that you can take our additional information locations. Uh, I first want to recognize that I am here on Hawaii, which is an incredibly special place on this planet, in this ocean. It's special biologically, it's special evolutionarily, and it's special culturally. And I feel honored to be around Hawaiians who care so much for the natural resources here from the waves all the way down to the coral. So I want to recognize the Hawaiian people, the cultural heritage, and this beautiful aina that I am lucky enough to be spending time with. Um, Hawaiian islands have over 4, 100,000 acres of living reef, the largest uh, acreage of coral reef in US controlled, I guess, whatever, in the United States. 
Uh, more than 60% of coral reefs that are in US waters uh, are in Hawaii. And most of, the, most of those over half are in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, the Kapuna Islands, also in those sense, the, the Papahanao, Mokuakea, which we are actually uh, celebrating the 15th year anniversary of establishment in 2007, then the largest green protected area in the world. Uh, it has some of the healthiest reefs as well as protecting hundreds of species endemic unique to Hawaii. Uh, the, the reefs here in Hawaii, actually I work in Southeast Asia where the reefs are not as good in the Coral Triangle, more human impacts. There's, there is a lot more care here and it seems like despite some of this many impacts that we are experiencing, a lot of the reefs that I've been seeing particularly in West Kona and South Kona are pretty healthy compared to many areas on the planet. So we have a lot of work ahead of us. Over half the reefs of the world are somehow threatened or imperiled or lost. We have the other 50% to take care of and all those animals from the fish to the invertebrates to sharks to manage, to take care of, to keep in, the, in their home, keep them living where we can appreciate them and they can do their thing that they do best and keeping the ocean ecosystem healthy. So happy uh, respect for fish today. Today we're focusing on the commercial live fish trade in Western Hawaii, a very current issue a controversial issue, an issue that's really got a lot of people uh, in arms, upset if you're a diver or if you're a local, seeing this, uh, this cultural extraction of millions of fish from the reefs impacting not only the fish, but the animals themselves. Um, I do want to, to recognize Kaimi. Uh, thank you, Aloha. I know, know if you can, uh, maybe we can have you on and say, say hello and Tell us about the importance of fish to Hawaiian people. I don't think I can manage, uh, I can unmute him. Lisa, do you? Aloha, Maika. Oh, you know, uh, no, Imaiao, Hana. Kula Kaya, um, ah, love the pole. I mean, I'm um, from Miloli, one of the last fishing villages. I'm a teacher at a, a charter school and also a fisherman here, Malama, and taking care of this um, place that we love. Um, to the people, our, especially our Hawaiian people, um, we have learned um, this from when we were young, generation after generation, about caring for the ocean and, and its. Um, and inhabitants and they're like a extension of our family so they are part of our ohana so a lot of um you know uh, what we wanted to share about is that deep connection and that relationship to the resource and how important it is to our livelihood and where we're where we live we're one of the last fishing communities in the state that are um you know we really want to malama and take care of this place especially actually um, what happens out there on the ocean. So, um, you know, if you go back into the um, genealogy of our people, the Mokuauhau, the Kumulipo, it talks about all the different um, uh, things that have come before us from the corals to the different, um, the, all the um, species. And um, today's subject is really important because it's part of our history and genealogy. So um, I just want to share that and just wanted to uh, welcome to all the rest of our uh, people on our co-panel. Cool um, I'm just waiting for my dad to come, but he will be there um, on shortly when I can um, bring him over here so he can introduce himself and also be a part of the discussion today. Mahalo, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so maybe we could just start with what is Respect for Fish Day? I'll throw it out to our panelists. Sure, well, I can start since um, it's an In Defense of Animals initiative. This is Lisa Levinson, the Campaigns Director with In Defense of Animals. And we're so thrilled. This is our second annual um, Respect for Fish Day, which was launched in 2020. And this is one of our featured events to uh, give people the resources to take action to save fish. And the whole point of it is to really raise awareness about how fish are um, abused and exploited in various industries 
uh, around the globe. And here we are together to raise awareness. We've got 250 organizations who've signed on as allies uh, to this Respect for Fish Day to also try to push out this message. So that's our intention is to help save the fish. Great. And in addition, I guess there's uh, several take actions around that recognizing fish and perhaps the plight of fish. And, and that's something that uh, the film, The Dark Hobby does really well. And uh, I got in contact with Paula as uh, my role with the International Ocean Film Festival in San Francisco, which is truly international. It's a traveling film festival. We take it to Asia as well and Europe. And unfortunately we just missed the, uh, we just locked our show. So we wanted to work together somehow. I wanted to support it. I, I have spent a lot of my life in Hawaii back and forth and it's a very special place to me. I, and, and so I really jumped on the opportunity after I watched the film. So I encourage everyone to see the film and to share it and also share some of the links on the website. Uh, but uh, I'd like to also just feature that uh, our Hawaiian cultural representatives, our friends uh, are also highly featured in the film and you get a really good feel for not only the beauty of the land, the aina, but also the, the meaningfulness that uh, not only the ocean, but fish are to the Kaupikos and, and the village of Milali'i. And so I thought we could talk a little bit about the film because we have so many people on the panel that are in it. Uh, and starting with maybe Bob, Snorkel Bob, uh, can you tell me like what turned you from, I know you were started out as a scuba diver. I don't know your complete history, how you landed on Oahu, but uh, I know you're a photographer, a really good one, and obviously a businessman uh, renting snorkel gear and exposing the public to the wonders of the subsurface of the ocean. Uh, what turned you into an activist? Um, I would say uh, foremost, um, seeing what they were doing really got me pissed off. Over there, I've been in this many years, and um, you know, at, at, at the outset, uh, we, we um, I say we, it was those of us who happen to know each other socially, who had an interest in uh, reef matters and reef health and critters and all that, uh, really um, isolated, recognized three issues, and I won't go into all three. The first was gill nets. It took about, uh, by the way, I'm not on Oahu, I'm on Maui. I live on Maui, I've lived on Maui forever. Uh, and, and it took six months to get uh, gill nets banned on Maui. And the rest of the state is still kind of a mishmash. You can take a gill net and, and set it differently. And then it's called a pie pie net, same net, but it's legal. So anyway, on Maui, gill nets are illegal. The second thing was um, water clarity and also uh, what we have here, injection wells on the shore. They pump a lot of the nitrogen. It's, the polite word is nutrient rich soup, it's sewage over the reef and it kills corals. Uh, just an excellent group of people came out of the woodwork on that. And I felt that liberated me to go to the, the next and third campaign. This will only take a few months and that was the aquarium trade. And those guys were just heinous. And in, in, in year one uh, of the legislative side of things, uh, we, we, we ran a bill just to see who would come out of the woodwork and it was unbelievable. Uh, a lot of these guys had and have rap sheets and the personalities that go along with that. Uh, it's a rough and tumble crowd, Kaimi knows, he's been there. Uh, we have stood shoulder to shoulder on the front lines. Both of us have been accused and yelled at. Uh, and that tends to, to self-propagate. Over the years, I've gotten compliments on a regular basis for my diligence and perseverance. It's neither of those. It's obsessive compulsive. And now, th and this is a milestone. And, and when you ask your first question, David, about uh, respect for fish, you know, Mary Finelli has been in this as long as I have, and, and she comes from a different angle. And I have to really kind of temper that angle on the sentient being. I said, come on, a lot of the people we're trying to win over here had fish for lunch, and you're talking about spirit and soulfulness and all that. Uh, we, we really need to stay on point and on target here. And I was pretty hard line and hard nose on that subject on a practical basis. I am a pragmatist politically. And I think now this is really a blessed time. Uh, the world is upside down and inside out. And we're on the verge of, of mass calamity for better and worse. 
What a time to take a look and gain perspective. Yeah, it's time to respect living creatures no matter what they are. Uh, I set spiders outside. M most people do because everyone's aware of, of the world we live in now. And, you know, I, I had uh, individual fish as personal friends from early times, snorkeling and diving. Uh, and, and, and I've said many times, you know, you, it's like uh, you see somebody at the mall and you don't think twice. If you see them every day, well, then it's familiarity and, and, and then there's recognition and friendship. And it's the same thing with a fish. Uh, so I think it's, this, this is a milestone time and it's, it's, it's really a blessed time for this sort of thing. I would like for give the baton to Mary here and, and back me up how, how we have, we've kind of melded here. I'm, I'm practical. I think you are more spiritual, philosophical and this is a convergence and I feel good about it. Yeah, well, thank you, Bob. It's, you know, it's really not a matter so much even of being spiritual per se. It, it's a matter of, it really, really truly boils down to respect for fish as sentient beings. And, you know, we're so culturally conditioned, society is so culturally conditioned to, to not even think that fish can feel, you know, and people who say they're vegetarian, yet they eat fish, they don't even recognize fish as, as, uh, as animals. And a lot of uh, laws don't recognize fish as animals even. Uh, they're not covered by any federal protection for their well-being. A lot of state anti-cruelty laws don't even cover fish. Um, but, you know, now just within the past few decades, we really have the technology to study fish in their natural habitat. And there's been you know, scientific experimentation and there's so much evidence now that fish are sentient. They do feel fear and pain and they, they have a very strong will to live. We, we're realizing that they're, so they have sophisticated forms of intelligence and learning. Um, they, there's tool use, fish have been shown to use tools. They have long-term memory. They form relationships, friendships, they have families. You know, they're, they're, they are sentient beings who deserve as deserving as, of respect and protection as any other sentient beings. And uh, an, um, in the, the film, Dark, The Dark Hobby, there is an interview with Jonathan Balcom, who wrote the book, What a Fish Knows, which is <laughs> a treasury of information about fish and how um, intelligent and amazing and admirable they are. So yes, it's... well said. And there are a couple links uh, in the chat if people want to learn more about that. And as well, I wrote a blog yesterday about sharks because we're shark stewards and people often malign sharks. Uh, but Hawaii has just recently protected sharks against commercial fishing and tournament fishing. And uh, But you need the whole ecosystem. So you can't just protect the sharks because the sharks need shark food. And the shark food needs habitat all the way down, it's all interconnected. Uh, and, and so when you're underwater, as, as I know Bob can attest, I mean, I loved it in the dark hobby uh, that you'd see a moray eel and moray eels, they should be terrified of us, <laughs> but they can be very, very gentle. They'll come out, they can actually recognize you. Uh, same with sharks. We see sharks that become uh, conditioned to recognize you over time. And that there is no way, and I'm talking about great white sharks, and there's no way that shark would bite me. And I'm not a grizzly man, I'm actually a scientist and I'm used to speaking in the language of scientists, but I definitely am connected spiritually to the ocean and to our swimming friends. So thank you, Mary. And well, we're t well since we're talking about the dark hobby and fish, uh, I'd, I'd like Paula to chime in because she's really kind of our centerpiece here. And, and uh, what inspired you to make the film? Because I know your other work is more like the Dalai Lama, other, other films on spirituality, more less about fish. Uh, what inspired you to take on such a, such a, uh, a topic as this commercial atrocity off of Hawaii? Well, I have been snorkeling a great deal in, in Kona many years ago, maybe about 22 years ago, and returned there about 17 years after that. And previously, snorkeling in Kona, there had been so many schools of fish, just fantastic, you know, all around you in the bay there. And when I went back years later, I happened to go into a snorkel bob shop and we uh, rented our gear, we went into the bay and sure enough, there are hardly no fish. There is hardly no one, you know, in there sharing the bay with you. And on that same 
trip we've been in Maui, we've, we've been to about three different snorkeling sites and there were, were very little, very, very few uh, members of, of the reef wildlife there. So I walked into the shop to return the gear and said, where are all the fish? And it was just very disappointing. And the people working there told me about Robert Rittner and pointed out his beautiful books of photography and writing where he's covered and done so much research over so many years on this topic. And I got to meet him and we discussed the problem of what's going on with the aquarium trade. I knew nothing about it. Like most people traveling around the world, you see aquariums, they look absolutely spellbinding, beautiful. And I came to know through speaking with Robert how the fish are caught and the suffering they endure and the fact that 90% of them die within a year of capture and just a lot of terrible consequences coming out of this trade to the species and to the reef. And I found out through people like Kaimi, Kalkiko and his father Billy deeper into the situation. So uh, through Jonathan Belcom, Gail Grabowski, a lot of fantastic people who I refer to as conservation heroes, both scientists, native Hawaiians, and they led us through all of the material we needed. And we gathered it with the great um, stupendous work that Robert and Keith Christie have done with all of their diving all over the world. We found out while using their footage, underwater footage of the species, what's going on. And we found out about Indonesia and so many places, Palau, Cuba, some of the places in Asia where um, dynamite is being used to blow up, you know, to stun the fish, which also blow, blows up and hurts the reefs and cyanide, uh, which really hurts the fish. So just so many things. It was a convergence of a great deal of material. And we worked very hard on the film for a long time. And we were led through the 12 or 13 years of unbelievable advocacy and fighting in the courts and through so many campaigns that Robert Wittner and so many of the people there have done trying to protect reef wildlife. So that's how we got involved in making the film. That's a, a great way, uh, a great segue and a great introduction to the ocean, an unfortunate one, but a fortunate one to meet Robert and the new direction. Uh, the film is very compelling as well as visually compelling. There really are some beautiful images as well as some very sobering images, such as you mentioned the cyanide fishing, particularly damaging method of fishing that stuns the fish, kills many, but also destroys the coral reef that not only the fish, but thousands of other species rely on. Uh, we work in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines where fish bombing, we see the results of fish bombing. And I've seen a crater that was first blown up over 25 years ago, still not recovered, not fully colonized by corals because they're so slow growing. So, uh, David, you know, yes. Can we make a point on that? Um, yes. the, we, we had access to uh, really tons of, of compelling footage on um, death and destruction and, and gory stuff that we avoided. And it was a conscientious strategy among uh, Paula and the other uh, people involved with the dark hobby and, and me too. And I've always made a point of this with my photography to avoid that sort of thing. Yeah, we showed briefly uh, cyanide fishing and dynamite blasting on reefs. Uh, but I feel like, speaking of a blessed age and a time for things to turn around, I feel like um, many people are like-minded. And that's the audience we, we want to target. And I don't want to see that stuff. I don't need to see it. I don't want to see it. And if it's put in front of me, I'll turn it off. And so we avoided it. We, we wanted to present the positive side, which is really, here's what we're, we're, we're really working hard to save. The ocean is resilient. The ocean will bounce back. Um, we've seen species disappear. Literally, you can't find a single one. And then they return. 
Uh, I won't go into enumeration, but there's a bunch of them here on Maui. Now we got rid of the aquarium thugs. Uh, so I, I just want anybody who hasn't seen the dark hobby, don't be uh, uh, you know, apprehensive that you're gonna see something that's gonna get you depressed. This movie makes people happy and that was a, a real conscientious objective. Thank you, Bob. That's a really good point. Uh, I am also a filmmaker and I've made several films about shark finning and my first one in 2006 called Shark Sewers of the Reef did have some of that and it does turn you off. And this morning we had a, another conversation hosted by Indefensive Animals and the Dark Hobby with filmmakers uh, Le Le Leilani Munter with, who is with Luis Ahoyos who made The Cove, which is particularly sobering and most people can't bear to see these dolphins treated this way. And I guess those, those images do cause sensation and action in some cases, but I'm kind of the same mind now. I just want to show beauty and I want to show elevation, which is why we work with kids because kids still have wonder and they're seeing, they don't see the fish we see, but if they see a fish, they're so excited. Uh, so thank you. That's a really good point. Cause the dark hobby is, it, it does discuss a dark practice, which is the commercial trade and uh, extraction of fish uh, killing many. And I guess maybe we can address that. Like how heinous, is this trade uh, that's occurring here. And, and I think it's really a dark secret. It's, it's, it's a tip, you see the tip of the iceberg once you see those fish for sale at Petco or online or in the aquarium store. So how, how bad is this problem really? I think there's only two things you need to know uh, which will frame the aquarium trade for what it is. Uh, item one, out of two is there are 27 to 28 million reef wildlife individuals in the aquarium pipeline at all times. Item two, it's not 90%, it's 99%. If you wanna be conservative, that makes you comfortable, fine, you can use 90. Uh, that's the mortality rate within uh, one year of the point of capture. Uh, and that is what all those fish that died demand replacement. And that's what the trade calls sustainable. It's a bottom line sustainability. It's 100% commercial and it's toxic. And these guys will stop at nothing. We could go on for days talking about anecdotal uh, episodes of, of, of their crimes and misdemeanors. But again, we wanna stay positive. Okay, yeah, that's just, I mean, it's just a shocking number. And, but as you said, especially with fish, that are highly fecund, that is they can have a lot of offspring, eggs and, and milk that meat, they could actually recover if we don't fish them, as long as they have a place to live that's healthy. So creating marine protected areas and stopping overfishing or stopping fishing uh, in this case can really give the fish a break. And as Sylvia Earl says, you know, they, the fish can come back, there is hope. Uh, but I, why don't we address, uh, I'd like to talk to Ashley and how does your work, because you are frontliners on conservation of, or protection of animals, can you uh, address how are you working with fish in the wildlife world? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think so much of our work um, involving fish has, has been about trying to change people's perspective, trying to help people understand that these are living sentient beings who are deserving of respect. And, you know, when I started working for PETA 14 years ago, so often I was met with, you know, this suggestion that, you know, from people, well, fish don't even feel pain. And now I get a lot less of that. I think people have learned a lot about animals in the past several years. I mean, every day we're seeing a new study coming out. I think social media has made a lot of people more aware about animals, especially younger people. But, we, I still encounter a lot of people who don't think of fish as, uh, you know, they might understand that they feel physical pain, but not necessarily thinking of fish as individuals who experience loneliness or frustration, um, you know, just, just as we do. And they're not thinking of the way that a fish is, is experiencing extreme deprivation when they're kept in an aquarium setting. Um, and obviously what we see at a place like Petco, some of these, some of these bowls, some of these habitats are so tiny. I mean, keeping a fish in an aquarium, you know, at, at all, it's not where they're supposed to be. But when you see some of these fish being sold basically as ornaments um, in, in tiny bowls, it is so disturbing when you think about 
how they must be suffering. And so one, one thing that we've done actually um, to get people to think about this is we, uh, we have an expose video about beta fish, but we've done um, demonstrations where we ask people to get in a cramped little space <laughs> while they watch this video. And the visceral reactions that people have had, I mean, when, you know, when they actually think about what it would be like to live like this, um, you know, you can tell people don't, I, I think, you know, a, a few different people have said, people, I think most people have the instinct to be kind. They're not thinking about the suffering that's being caused. They're not thinking about what's, what's happening before these fish end up on these shelves and, you know, what they're experiencing after they get home. Um, they're not thinking about the terrible message this sends children when you uh, teach them that fish are basically just merchandise or animals, you know, are merchandise or decorations. So yeah, so much of this just comes down to changing people's perspective and just encouraging them to, um, to think differently about fish, think of fish as animals. And, you know, we think of them as wildlife. It, it, it's so often referred to as resources to be managed or extracted and traded and particularly at shark fin. Um, and right, it, they're wildlife and wildlife deserves to be kept in the wild. Uh, so it's, it's great. And I know that PETA is really on the front lines. Uh, and I, we, we had somebody in the, uh, the Q&A uh, who also shouted out Antoinette about Jonathan Balcombe's book, who's in the film, What a Fish Knows, that in the dark hobby. But uh, he, he uses the word, Jonathan does the word fish is instead of fish is a singular rather than respecting their individuality. But it's funny because uh, scientists use the word fishes you know, because it represents many species because there are over 33,000 species of fish in the ocean. I mean, it's, it's just extraordinary. Uh, so even by how we call them, the name that we term them, cold fish, whatever, you know, they, especially sharks get this negative connotation that if we, if we do think about them in a different way and term them in a different way, uh, we might approach them and have more compassion for them. And this came up, uh, Leilani Munter brought this up about, uh, which was really interesting. I hadn't heard this, but there was a scientific study that if you can reach 10% of the people who can believe in something, they can influence the rest of, of people's decision-making. So 10% is not a huge number. So if we can influence people's attitudes about taking fish or eating wildlife and consider them uh, companions or co-inhabitants of our planet, uh, that we might be able to achieve greater protection. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And, and Mary, you work in a sort of a similar vein. Um, do you wanna add, add to that? Well, I would say that, you know, uh, it's true that aquariums are very um, inappropriate place for uh, a fish to live. But for people who do want to keep fish and can provide a decent home for them, uh, it's to please don't buy, buy them. You can adopt them from an animal shelter. You can go to a rescue group. You can find fish who need rehoming on Craigslist or other places. People who have fish who are trying to find another home, giving them away for free but please don't buy them. And also, you know, if you really are one to have an aquarium, one to see fish, you can get an aquarium and put a TV set inside it and play videos of just the most amazing footage from that you could never have in an actual aquarium, all kinds of, of fishes and, and aquatic animals, aquatic life. Um, there's also live cams. You can watch actual live cams of wildlife out in the wild. So there's so many ways to enjoy fishes and, um, and uh, learn about them without actually keeping them captive. Right, right. Yeah, and there are, and that was in the film, uh, the live fish cam, and we're seeing more of those as well uh, in, in science too, where you can actually observe animals remotely without influencing them. And uh, yeah, see, I like that. <laughs> Just turn on the TV or put put a video and loop it <laughs> instead of an aquarium. Uh, so I, I think, uh, I think we might have Willie or Kaime, Kaime, did you, uh, chime in a little bit? I think I might have overridden you, but do you have something you want to add? Um, I, you know, I just a few things, um, you know, um, when, um, 
Bob was saying about, you know, the destruction of the industry, um, you know, his work in Maui is very, you know, we really on um on the big island where we are from, we are considered the golden coast for this industry. And um we have worked with the county, the ledge, every possible avenue we could until we ended up um taking it to court. But um being there firsthand, seeing what they done community was also in the um, collection part of it. So they will collect them for the traders um, who will send them and sell them to the to the rest of the world. And um, it has caused um, a major destruction and uh, it, it destroys the reefs. It is, and of course, we believe majority, like um, Bob said, 90 plus percent is they don't survive. So the mortality, um, and that's the science that we have. We, we, we continue to share that with the state and um, the battle is still here. Um, you know, we recently had some big things happen, but um, you know, any way me and my dad can be uh, involved to share what has what we have experienced has been our goal since we started this fight. He's been doing it for over 30 years. Uh, when we were little, uh, when they first started to come to Kona and started to really um, show who they were, we, we didn't understand. And then culturally, we don't, it's not part of what we do is culturally. So it didn't really make sense uh, of putting a fish in an aquarium tank. Um, so eventually, um, you know, we're here today and um, our goal is to continue to educate and um, outreach because a lot of people don't think it's causing um, them um, any harm because of what they look at it. But um, through our work, we have really seen a change and majority of the people have already supported this, um, you know, to end this trade, um, to end the collection. And... Um, Whatever we can do has been, um, we feel we are still going towards that direction. And, um, you know, um, I'm very thankful to, to be a part of this and um, share and give you guys an insight of, of just what she, what's happening on, on um, Ground Zero. Thank you. And, and you kind of referred to, to it, but um, the concept of Pono. And that, that was, your father said that in the film and, and being Pono. And maybe, can you describe that? What is being Pono? Well, Pono is, is a state of um, being um, uh, um, to do, well, Pono is to, to do what is right. And in our culture, we, we look at everything as a connection and a relationship. And when he goes out and he does what he does, he's trying to follow the cultural foundational guidelines that our coin people practice. And um, today you don't see a lot of that. The, the industry itself is not porno but then you look at just in general the overfishing of everything and other things that have happened to the land to the world and the and you can see the reefs are being detrimented by just um you know what they do with the collection so it, it causes a uh just destroying these places that are so pristine and and um we don't want to see that happen anymore so um, he just teaches that every day when he wakes up and goes to work and he teaches us that same mentality. So we're very, very blessed. And you, te you teach your kids, because you're, you're a teacher too, right? So it keeps going down. Thank you for that. Um, well, I, I guess kind of that segues in, uh, you know, how can we help uh, the, the Hawaiians in your village? How can we help uh, the fish? And, and I guess maybe I can call on Bob again, like, where are we? Because there has been a recent decision. There have been several lawsuits. The fishery yeah. uh, was closed. Yeah. Uh, it looks like some areas have been recovering. You know, you mentioned the, the Kona Coast, and I always think of it uh, because where I am in Kahalu'u is you see so many yellow tangs, the uh, Laupi, Laupala. They're so beautiful, and the waves actually are yellow from these fish that are very expensive. I saw one for sale on uh, on the web for like almost $500. And they're so beautiful and so important because they are eating the algae off the coral and keeping the coral. So maybe it's, I don't know if that's where it came from the Gold Coast, but I think it, the yellow gold from those that wonderful fish. That is where fish. it came from. That's because when the waves came up right before <laughs> okay. the of yellow tanks and they called the Gold Coast. Now it's because of multi-million dollar lots in uh, uh, yeah. Kualalai and the Pauli in there. Um, Kaimi made reference to the state, and I want to clarify a couple things. Uh, first, I want to backtrack to Petco. Petco is toxic. I would like to ask everyone, do not buy anything at Petco. 
they will come out and say that they're not selling any marine wildlife anymore when they are. Uh, I was in Petco and they had a, a fresh arrival of a tank of uh, anemone clownfish, what they also call true Nemo. And the, the guy was particularly proud of these because they were all wild caught. And I said, why do you have wild caught when this is one of the easiest uh, species to grow in captivity? He says, but people really, the market really demands wild caught. They're so much more fun to watch. They just never stop swimming up and down in the corner, up and down. The, they're so much more agitated, more entertaining. Uh, so that's my pet co bit. The other thing is we've had some insight in this campaign. Uh, Kaimi made reference to the state. Kaimi and his dad, Willie, and I have, and, and a few others have met with two different governors. The current governor who gives invertebrates a bad name. I've seen invertebrates who stand up straighter and stay awake longer than the current governor and the former governor. Um, and we met with him in his chambers. Uh, Kami remembers it well. His dad, Willie, reminds me of my performance there uh, on a regular basis. I didn't mean to um, embarrass anybody, but uh, it was um, Neil Abercrombie. And he called me out and I called him right back. He appointed a card carrying aquarium collector as director of, of land and natural resources. Uh, and, and he said, he called that, and when I called him back, he said, that's the politics of personal destruction. I said, that's the politics of reality, sir. Uh, it's hard to respect the office when you have that kind of corruption. We went from Abercrombie to Ige. Now, Ige's appointment to DLNR director is, is Suzanne Case. She's a lawyer. She's not stupid by any means. She's smart enough to be devious, I'll tell you that. She came to DLNR, state agency head, from 20 years of executive director at the Nature Conservancy. The Nature Conservancy is so diabolical and compliant with the aquarium trade that here we have the battle between big fishing and reef recovery. And it all comes down to the Nature Conservancy. This goes back politically decades uh, when, when uh, the late Senator Daniel Inouye formed, uh, was all under NOAA, and National Marine Fisheries. This is all the Department of Commerce. Should be an interior, but it's commerce. And that's the operative word, commerce. And then they formed Westpac, the Western Pacific, uh, help me out, Kami, Western Pacific Regional Advisory. It's all about commercial oh, fish. Council. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is the largest recipient of NOAA funding in Hawaii history. And Suzanne Case, who's director, she is the state on this issue. I refer to Suzanne Case and the current governor. Uh, he's, he's widely known as Governor Mild and Murky as Master Blaster. <laughs> Uh, and she rides on his shoulders and whispers in his ear, here's what you do next. And he does, he does everything she says, and she will do anything, override the Supreme Court on their ruling to stop this trade. We got injunctive relief and she overrode it. What can everyone do out there? Square one, do not give money to the Nature Conservancy and do not shop at Petco. Square two, stand by. <laughs> uh, because this is not yet resolved. We had a huge hearing and it could have been, it could have been, the last nail in the aquarium trade coffin. Here's hoping and let that bastard sink in a hurry. But Suzanne Case stepped in and voted with, uh, they waited until one of the members, seven members, so there wouldn't be a tie. One of them didn't show up because he had seven days left on his, uh, on his term and maybe he was asked not to show up, we don't know. But it ended up being a tie. Suzanne Case voted for the trade. One of the guys was affiliate with the Nature Conservancy and then a th we had three votes against, they had three votes for including two from the Nature Conservancy. So now it's still unresolved. They have a ton of legal hurdles they must clear. Suzanne Case is not afraid and perfectly willing to break the law on this. And she's a lawyer. I met with her two times, three times. No, it's two times. Every time she said, it's been litigated. It's been litigated. I like to say, I used to say she's cast in stone. Now I say she's cast in concrete. It's been litigated. It's been, we got to the Supreme Court and there's the ultimate litigation. And now she says nothing. She just railroads against it. See Kaimi, my pal nodding down there. He was there, he is there. So stay tuned, tighten your helmets. It's not, it doesn't end. You know, you talk about a blessed time. Lucky for me, I like the action <laughs> because it's, it's, it, it, it's a scrum. The scrum never ends. And we stay tuned, we stay alert, and, and we stay on it. And, and I would ask for everyone to, to pay attention and follow along. Maybe we'll have a sequel. <laughs> Paul is over there going, oy vey. <laughs> well, I think there's uh, a couple of weeks left and then the 
the LNM where we'll be meet, meeting again, right? Because it, interestingly, it if you have a tie vote, it's a de facto pass of the environmental assessment. Yeah. Instead of killing it is how it should be, it's how actually it a pass. And it is interesting that someone wasn't there to vote to be the tiebreaker. Right. Uh, so how will people be able to follow this, Bob? I would say follow the Dark Hobby website. Um, we have gone, you know, the whole the whole thing for years, we were in the legislature, we were in the judiciary, met with both governors several times. I don't even count that because neither one of them, they, they do what they want to do. It doesn't matter to them. Uh, they were both corrupt. Maybe we'll get a better governor ne next time. We can only speculate. Uh, I looked at the whole campaign in Hawaii as supply side. This is where the fish come from. The dark hobby was meant to take a new angle and that's go to the demand side. We hope to marginalize the home hobbyists. Most people out there, when I say most people, I'm talking about you know, intelligent aware people, they assume that someone somewhere is growing these fish and it's not true. And that's what the dark hobby reveals. Uh, these fish are extraordinary critters. They're just incredible. And when you see them in the wild up close, it's just like um, last week I was on a dive and one of my favorite subjects is uh, a yellow tail chorus. Uh, that's actually how I met Jonathan Balcon. He made contact on one of my posts, said, can I use this in my lecture? I said, yeah, have at it. Um, and, I, and I love these fish because they're irrepressible. They're wrasse in the wrasse family. They're irrepressible, constantly in motion, and they, they'll come at you. And um, I was trying to get one of them, give me a shot, give me a shot, come on, turn around, give me a shot, slow down. And she just wouldn't do it. You can tell the coloration distinguishes males from females. It's a female. And another female came along and just looked and she, and she butted in. She said, you're doing this all wrong. And she did the poses for me. And I got some of my best shots ever. The point is, it comes down to the individuals. You can make all the generaliz generalizations you want to about species. Nobody likes it when they talk about New Yorkers and those obnoxious accents or Texans and those stupid hats. Uh, but those are generalizations. You can't say those things. Same about fish. They have individual personalities. And when you make a friend and you go back to the same place, uh, that's when you can understand uh, what we're talking about here as a social order, uh, personalities. It's, it's the real deal. That's great. It's true. People do tend to stereotype and it is hard with fish. And I just wanted to share this. I don't know if you can see, it's a yellowtail chorus and the juvenile underneath, which is kind of the Hawaiian Nemo fish because the clownfish do not live here, but it has that same coloration and they have this crazy little behavior. They're really hard to photograph because they won't stand still. Um, and they really are beautiful fish. I was able to see some of these fish just this week here in Kona. Uh, we do have in the chat, uh, and I do want to thank everybody. We've had a lot, great participation and interaction, both in the chat, over 62 per, uh, participants now, and hopefully on Facebook even more. Uh, so thank you again, Indefensive Animals and the Dark Hobby for hosting this celebration and action day on Respect for Fish Day with our, my co-panelists. Uh, there's actually, some, there's a, a link to some fact sheets and somebody says, take these to the aquarium supply stores and pass them out and tell them about really where these fish are coming from, that they're not being bred. What is it, 2% of all the, the fish in the aquarium trade are, are actually bred and husbandry? Saltwater, yes. Freshwater is about 98% captive bred. Saltwater is just the opposite. Uh, and Petco will lie uh, with, with integrity, they think, uh, and say, we don't sell wild caught fish. And it's just a lie. You can go into any Petco anywhere and see them and then you're probably gonna see distressed fish. It's, it's a crime against nature and it's happening at Petco on a regular basis. Willie. Can, can, I, just Willie. Add that? <laughs> yeah, can, can I just add that even within the um, captive bread industry, it's rife with animal suffering and death. So yes. you know, we really shouldn't be buying fish at all, live or dead. Yeah, and I didn't mean to suggest that, I'm, that I like captive breeding, I don't. It's really a phantom and, it, and it's, it's not right. And, and, and it actually is. I mean, for all of us, especially people uh, who love the ocean, it's, it's offensive to me uh, as a marine biologist, but also somebody who loves the ocean. It's clearly offensive to people who feel for wildlife, but it's also probably more offensive to people who have lived here in Hawaii, who 
uh, have their families here. They come from a, a great heritage of mariners and people connected to the ocean. So on that, I, I really wanted to, to, to recognize uh, with us, uh, so grateful Willie Calpico is here. Is yourself. He's the mayor of Mi Milali'i. Uh, he's also a plaintiff like his son Kaimi uh, in these important suits to try to stop this nefarious aquarium trade to protect Hawaiian reefs. But he's also a teacher, uh, Konohiki, he's a caretaker steward of, of his village, of his ocean, of his reef, a cultural practitioner. Um, and uh, if I may say a kupuna, so uh, aloha. Say hello. Aloha. Whatever they say to put yourself. Yeah, so anyway, um, Bob uh, David. and David, um, so uh, you guys are more so what gathering information or trying to do some kind of concern about this uh, what are the, the lawsuit and the, the, the I'm kind of angry with Suzanne them you know who they voted for the project you know what I mean for the, yeah, yeah. the thing you know I, I think they should step down because they they're not working for the interests of the people the native people and all, all people, you know what I mean? They gotta be thinking about, you know, this is our fish, you should leave them in the ocean. Don't take them. They go back to their place and get their own. What do you think, Bob? Well, I think you're spot on, Willie. And, um, and, and, and I've already expressed gratitude for your participation and spirit in this thing. And, um, and we will proceed. Uh, I, I think that uh, we, we just have to wait and see what happens. I think that the cards are in our favor, but it's not going to be um, it's not going to be a given, and we have to stay diligent and stay stay ready and stay active. Yeah, yeah. I I believe, I, I want to thank my Mahasha and all the, the Earth Justice people doing a fantastic work and paying a very good attention to these things going on. You know what I mean? Uh, I can't believe. How they making all those false statements, AIS stuff? You know, this just like kids. You know what I mean? We cannot be messing around. This is serious games. You know, we gotta get down to protect and take care of what what's in the ocean. Yeah. Sad, Bob. It's so sad. I can't understand sometimes. Yeah, yeah. We'll stay on it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mahalo. Uh, that was really great of, of uh, Willie to join us. You can tell he's in the village. You can hear the kids. They're down at the ocean near the canoes. <laughs> it's a beautiful, tranquil place. And people live very, very close to the sea. Uh, so if you're just joining us, happy respect for fish day. We've uh, just about ready to wrap up. We have seven minutes left. So if you have questions, please put them down in the Q&A. Uh, we, we definitely have got some great attendees. I see a friend of mine, uh, Judith from Berkeley. Uh, and there's really some great links in the chat that you can take action that you can share, including the film, The Dark Hobby. And if you are in uh, Hawaii, especially if you're here in Kona, you can add your voice and uh, don't let this atrocity continue. The, the aquarium, commercial aquarium trade has been uh, going on for years. There were lawsuits, it was stopped. We see fish recovering. And now there's a potential for it to reopen, primarily because of greed. Uh, and I, I don't believe that there's people that I have met, local people would do this on the scale that is being, uh, the scale that it's occurring. Last night, I've been seeing right where I am, uh, what looks like poaching or fishing, probably a he'e or uh, the octopus. And they're diving and we're gonna kind of go and try to document this tonight. But uh, it, there is so much money involved. I think we need to stop not only the, the taking, but also the consuming. So break that supply chain. It's just something we tried to focus on in the shark fin trade. And uh, fortunately in the US, we're very, very close to stopping the shark fin trade. Uh, it was done first here in Hawaii, uh, then in the Western states. We now have 14 states that ban the sale and trade of shark fin. Uh, we were successful in Canada, thanks to young people uh, and a, a prime minister who's 
was much more liberal than the then president, but we do have uh, both the Senate and a Congress and a president who are more forward thinking when it comes to these heinous fisheries. I also had a link in there about the last large gillnet fishery that is occurring right now off of California that is killing marine mammals, killing seabirds, killing sharks. And that's also in the US Congress. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity to add your voice to your legislator wherever you live to support these legislations. And those links are in there. Um, yes, and I'll just pop in here real quick to say that in Defense of Animals, we have some action alerts also. We put the links in the chat, but ours are, one of them is a, against Petco. We've been talking about some of the issues there. And we also hosted a in-person demonstration protest today at uh, the Sequest Aquarium in Woodbridge, New Jersey, which was all about trying to stop uh, the aquarium itself that is also a source of uh, taking animals from their their habitats and so we encourage everybody to get involved and use all of the resources and we have another action alert about sharks as well so all of our groups are very aligned and we hope that you'll take a look at some of the resources that we've included and please take action on them today thank you Mary and I just put that back into the chat there uh, IDAUSA.org backslash save fish appropriately enough on respect of this day. Places, um, most people don't realize, you know, here in Hawaii in the legislative campaign, when we started, we made special dispensation to public aquariums because they have an educational function. That's what people all over the country will tell you. Oh, but these people are educational. The reason they don't want the aquarium trade to end is without these guys, especially in poor countries where they have to use cyanide and dynamite, these aquariums would have to mount their own collection expeditions, airfare for divers, uh, tanks, uh, holding tanks, transport and all that. The trade does it for them. That's why they fought us tooth and nail in the Hawaii legislature. So it's not a good idea. Mary pointed out reef cam. We pointed out in the dark hobby. That's the way to go. And nobody has to die on a reef cam. And there's none of this heinous extraction and mortality on a reef cam. And it's really dynamic. It's come a long way in a very short time. It supersedes all other options right now. And it's really good. So thanks for that, Lisa. Yeah, great point, Bob. And um, this morning, we also had the producer of uh, the Octopus Teacher and somebody in the chat said, watch it to educate people. But what was so wonderful about that film uh, is that it really showed this Again, like Bob with this more, you know, this human connection or the sea turtle, your intimate moment uh, in the dark hobby and, and, uh, and how we can connect with animals that look so unlike us and act so unlike us yet clearly have intelligence and deserve to live. And if we acted more like octopus, we might have, live in a better place. <laughs> so there are several links there for take action. I did want to call out to, there was a great quote that maybe it was Mary put in that Jacques Cousteau said, someone who influenced me, uh, and now we know in retrospect, writing certain manta rays and other things isn't, isn't PC, but he did, through his filmmaking, uh, expose a lot of people to the wonders of the underwater world. But he did say, no aquarium, no tank, on a marine land, however spacious it may be, can begin to duplicate the conditions of the sea. And I guess we might add, in respect for Fish Day, that they don't deserve to be, and we don't let them have to be in these aquariums or tanks. And there is a consciousness. If you look at movies like The Cove or uh, Blackfish, where you're seeing our, our cousins, our closest cousins, marine mammals that stayed uh, or actually went back to the ocean in these horrible conditions. And those, those are going, there. we are emptying the tanks and, and it's a lot through a lot of action. Like PETA, I know has been very active, uh, many groups probably here as well against uh, keeping marine mammals in the ocean where they belong. And that includes the, 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 the lesser, understa uh, lesser understood finny creatures. So we're just about to wrap up. We have like a minute or two left. Do we have any last thoughts? Um, I do want to thank you all so much. Uh, mahalo, especially for our Hawaiian uh, leaders and all of our friends in the audience. Um, hello. David, we just wanted to thank you a lot, uh, again for allowing this Respect the Reef Day um, from our community. I'm very blessed. Um, we're not going to stop fighting for 
our friends on the reef will go to the ends of this earth until we are last breath to Malama them. I just want to thank you guys for all doing what you can do for protection of our fish resources. And I just want to, whatever you want to say, that, go ahead. Yeah, whatever needs to be done, we, we got to take a stand to this. And um, I never give up for 30 years. And I think we're getting somewhere. All my friends was in the back with me, but you know, it's like no hope because uh, I, I kind of discussed it with the state, you know, just supporting these things and not, uh, I don't know what to think about it, but whatever we need to do, let's work together and make it right. Okay, mm -hmm. that's all I want to say to y'all. Mahalo. Mahalo. Thanks, Willie. Thank you so much, mahalo. Uh, anyone else, last statements? Uh, a lot of your websites and the links are in the chat and I know this is going to be shared, the recording by uh, Indefensive Animals and probably on the Dark Hobby website as well. And we'll put it on sharksewers.org website. Any last thoughts, Paula? Yes, yes please. Uh, everyone go to the darkhobby.com and you can sign up there to receive our newsletter uh, updates on actions that we can all take to protect marine wildlife and to follow what's happening there in Hawaii with all of our dear friends. It's been wonderful to see Kaimi, Willie, and Robert here with all of us today. Thank you so much. And David, you did a wonderful job with the panel. Yeah, thanks, David. Thank you all. Yes. Happy respect for this day. Malama Pono. Anybody else? Ask with that. I would say, you know, fish is desperately need all the help we can give them. And let's make every day respect for fish day. Wonderful. Thank you, Mary. I also I just want to encourage people to stay involved and spread the word about respect for fish day and adding to to add that into their their daily practice of compassion for all all living beings. Thanks, Lisa. And I think I would just also encourage people as you're boycotting businesses like Petco that are supporting this trade, be sure they know why. Um, you know, it, it's great not to shop there, not to support them, but, but tell them um, and do the same if you're at, if you stay at a hotel and you see a, an aquarium, if you go to a restaurant and you see an aquarium, let them know that you have a problem with it. Um, and if you contact, PETA or, uh, you know, I'm sure other organizations, um, we're happy to help businesses that, that want to um, remove um, aquariums and, you know, to, to help find better place for, for the inhabitants. So uh, just don't be afraid to speak up. Okay, well, on that note, thank you. Back to you, Lisa just about wrapped up and I'm going to go out and jump in and see some of our wild friends here off of Kona. So very, very blessed, very grateful. Wonderful. Thanks to everyone for joining us for Respect for Fish Day. We all have so much to share and learn with each other. Thank you for to David for hosting and uh, for today and to Paula and to everyone who's joined us on the panel, and to everyone who's uh, been participating for this, this time together. Thank you and enjoy celebrating Respect for Fish Day. Aloha. 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 Aloha.